Hello and welcome to The Harvest Show. Glad you could be with us today. Stefan Radelich here alongside Chuck Freebie and Ms. Valerie Lowe. Pete Summerall is out and about on assignment. We're going to hope to check in with him in just a very short while here about some of the new developments and forward progress of Lacey Broadcasting. How's everyone doing today? You guys doing well? Just great. Ready just, for the big weekend yes, coming up? Yes, I am. I was just thinking about it. And, uh, you know, we have Family Day every Memorial Day in uh, mm -hmm. in Florida. So I'll make it to Family Day. You're and getting I'm, down to Florida. Good. Yes, Very good. And, and we're playing games this uh, holiday season. And um, I think we're doing an egg toss. So okay. Not board games. You yeah, we're taking gonna advantage do a few, of the outside. Yeah, 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 yeah. we're going to be outside. We'll do a few board games. Do you do games. barbecue kind of thing or cookout? Yes, cookout? yes, we do. And then, you know, later on, my mom and my dad, they make us say why we're thankful for there Memorial Day. Wonderful, <laughs> wonderful. Good. Well, actually, just heard that uh, Mr. Pete Summerall, the president and CEO of Lacy Broadcasting, is now with us. Pete, if you can uh, just give us a little insight as to where you are. Well, yesterday, Stefan, I was able to travel from uh, South Bend down to uh, uh, the Virgin Islands and St. Croix. And I know that uh, that's one of the, the new stations that's coming into the Lacey Broadcasting family. And uh, I believe last week you were mentioning how that some of the final paperwork still has to be taken care of. Uh, how are we with that process with the FCC? You know, we filed at the FCC uh, for the transfer of ownership of the station here in St. Croix, and it's uh, in the process, and we hope that it'll be done uh, in June or July. And uh, today, I'm going to go to the station here in a little bit and uh, uh, connect on how we're going to do the transition from the current ownership to ourselves. But they've been airing a lot of LACI programming already. Okay, so Pete, I know when I think of St. Croix, I think of this amazing destination location. But talk about the ministry need there. You know, Valerie, really is interesting. Uh, this primarily is a vacation destination. Uh, tourism is the number one industry, and there's some other manufacturing and uh, other things that go on here, but tourism really is number one. Uh, but there's 110,000 people who live uh, in the U.S. Virgin Islands. There's no Christian television. And so we have a great opportunity, I believe, to be able to reach out to people who have the same problems we have anywhere else in the United States or around the world. Uh, there's over 300 churches. We're looking forward to connecting to someone and to some of them. Uh, actually, I've got some appointments scheduled this week to meet with some people here who have churches and programs on the station and look forward to being able to meet the needs of the local community. Well, that was my next question. Have you had an opportunity to meet with some of the locals and, you know, what are you expecting from them? What do you think they're going to say to you about the, the need there in St. Croix? Well, you know, first of all, I think they're going to be very thankful to have Christian television full time on a local basis. And that's one of the things that I think sets LaCie Broadcasting apart from virtually anybody else is we like to work with local churches. And so uh, our outreach here is going to uh, have, you know, the, the usual mix of Christian programming, uh, uh, you know, like the Joyce Myers of the world mm -hmm. and uh, those kind of programs. And our, of course, our Harvest Show and my dad's teaching program. But we're also going to have a lot of local churches. And that's one of the things that I think that sets us apart from everybody else. And so I'm going to be uh, focused very much on how we can meet the local needs of the local people. And surely there is a lot. And, you know, in a tourism environment, that means you're working with a lot of people who are in a service uh, employment, which means they're probably very low paid. And so there's a lot of needs and a lot of uh, issues that go on here. But at the same time, you know, it's, uh, it's a pretty nice environment to, uh, to be in. Pete, off your description, this sounds a lot like our expansion opportunity that we just took in Las Vegas, a, a service, a tourism-oriented city, um, population a little bit less in St. Croix, but people having the same kind of needs as Las Vegas. Do you see that similarity? It's very similar. Uh, you know, there's probably not the... Uh, casino environment, so to speak, that people think of quite often when they think of Las Vegas. But at the same time, it is a service-oriented uh, community, I believe, from what I can tell. And so consequently, there's a lot of people who uh, have a lot of financial challenges. There's a lot of health issues. Uh, sometimes, from what I'm understood from some of the people who live here, uh, the healthcare system is not quite up to speed of where it ought to be. And so uh, we're going to be able to meet a lot of needs, I believe, and I believe we're going to be a great impact in the market here. Do you see any other expansion opportunities on the horizon for LACI Broadcasting? Oh, Chuck. 
there are great <laughs> expansion opportunities. <laughs> We're actually in conversations with some other uh, television stations for some acquisitions, but Las Vegas and uh, uh, St. Croix is really the first two, the U.S. Virgin Islands. And so we're going to have a great opportunity to be able to expand. I'm very, very thrilled. We've got some programming changes coming to uh, FETV on the Dish Network and AT&T UVerse that I think is going to be dramatic and, and increase our, our viewing numbers on, on the Dish, on FETV quite a bit. And so uh, we've got a lot of opportunities in front of us. Very excited. Some great things have been happening just in the last few days. And uh, I look forward to seeing where God's taking this ministry. Hey, Pete, we've got uh, one more question before we say goodbye here today. Uh, you mentioned the outreach to the local community and uh, really across all of the U.S. Virgin Islands there. What about the tourism crowd? Uh, what's the, the, the numbers of folks that come through the islands uh, on, the tour, on tourism each and every year? And uh, what are your hopes with regards to the station being able to touch their lives as well? Stephen, so last time I heard, they have about 3 million tourists a year to come through wow. the U.S. Virgin Islands. And uh, that's a pretty big number, considering only 110,000 actually live here. Uh, I'm on St. Croix. There's three main islands of the U.S. Virgin Islands. And so uh, St. Thomas actually is the more touristy island than St. Croix. St. Croix is more of the manufacturing island. So uh, it'll be interesting to see how we can reach the tourists. Uh, we're we're going to work very hard to make sure that the signal is seen in all of the local hotels. And, uh, you know, we hope we can reach those tourists. Uh, you know, this morning as I was uh, having breakfast, I was uh, seeing a couple from England and seeing another family from India. Uh, and uh, the plane was packed yesterday with tourists. And, uh, you know, when people ask you, are, are you going to have a good holiday in St. Croix? And you tell them you're coming to work, they look at you like you're crazy. So uh, <laughs> most people... Most people do talk, do come here to actually to the vacation. They don't come to work like I do. Yeah. Well, uh, hopefully we can come there and work sometime too. <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, you know, I, you know, it, 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 this would be a pretty cool place to have a harvest show. I was already yeah. scoping out a couple locations that might be a, kind of cool. So uh, you'll have to talk to Mr. Huffman, the uh, producer, to see uh, if that would work out sometime in the uh, in the agenda. I believe uh, January would be a great time to have the show there. <laughs> I, well, I I couldn't agree more. That, uh, that would be a fantastic time to have a live show from, uh, from St. Croix. All right. Well, we'll talk to Chuck Huffman, and maybe you could put in a good word for us there. Uh, Pete, we're going to get to see you again this week, or are we going to catch up next week again? Uh, well, I'll be back next week, but uh, I'm going to be on the Memorial Day program as well, so we look forward to being with you. All right. Thanks for your time. Pete Summerall joining us live from St. Croix in the U.S. Virgin Islands, a new outreach and outpost for LaCie Broadcasting. Uh, really tremendous opportunity there. I like yeah. the fact, again, the same model that we've seen so effective mm -hmm. here in the United States and in the Middle East through METV as well. Uh, being utilized there, the family entertainment and, and uh, Christian programming mixed together, involvement of the local community, and then uh, trying to reach all those who pass through as well. And I think we, we can't lose sight of the need of ministry for ministry there in St. Croix because it is a beautiful tourist mm -hmm. destination, but tourists need to know about the love of Jesus. The locals need to know about the love of Jesus. Mm -hmm. So even though we jokingly say, oh, we want to go there and enjoy uh, the beautiful weather, there's a grave need who, there. Who was joking? Saint Oh, <laughs> so you weren't joking, no, right? No. Okay, so I'm not joking either, but I, I would love to go to St. Croix and uh, witness to people about the love of Jesus Amen. Christ through the Harvest Show. There you Let's go. Put it I'm with way. you on that one, Valerie. <laughs> Still to come here on Harvest Today, Christians have been talking about it for decades, but is this really the end times? Author Charles Krismier discusses the next big event on the prophetic clock. And is peace still possible? We're we'll going to talk with prophecy teacher Irvin Baxter a little bit later on to get his take on the stalled Middle East peace process talks. Also in today's Prosperity Matters, Dr. Harold Hazen discusses how, to, how soon to be retirees can maximize their Social Security benefits. So we ask you to stay with us. Chuck is up next with the international news. On this Thursday, May 22nd, 2014, here's what's happening in your world. Thailand's army chief has announced a military takeover of the government, saying the coup is necessary to restore stability 
and order after six months of political deadlock and turmoil. General Prayuth Chanoka announced in a statement broadcast on national television that the commission which imposed martial law Tuesday will now take control of the country's administration. The pivotal development comes a day after Prayuth summoned the country's rival political leaders for face-to-face -face talks. Thailand has been gripped by bouts of political instability for more than seven years. The latest round of unrest started in November when demonstrators took to the streets to try to force Prime Minister Yinluk Shinawatra to step down. The military is viewed as sympathetic to the protesters. A woman who says she was abducted by a man a decade ago who forced her to marry him and who fathered her child told KABC-TV in Los Angeles she's happy and blessed to be back with her family. The woman, who kept her back to the camera and did not give her name, described being reunited with her family and talked about the ordeal she said began when she was just 15 years old. I was 15. I can do it. I can do nothing. I just did what he wants I did. I don't have like these 10 years. Police described a decade during which the woman was made to move at least four times, given multiple fake identities to hide her from family and authorities. Santa Ana police arrested this man, Isidro Garcia, on suspicion of kidnapping for rape, lewd acts with a minor, and false imprisonment. His now 25-year-old accuser came forward to police on Monday after finding her sister on Facebook. Traditional hunters armed with homemade guns and poison spears have gathered in the hundreds in northeastern Nigeria, eager to use their skills to help find nearly 300 schoolgirls abducted by Islamic extremists. With Nigeria's military accused of not doing enough to rescue the girls, the hunters demonstrated their skills to an Associated Press cameraman to show swords and knives could do them no harm. One hunter claimed they have God on their side and they're not worried about the enemy's superior firepower. The hunters were chosen by the local government because of their knowledge of the region's terrain, something the Nigerian military lacks. In Ukraine, Sunday's vote is arguably the most crucial presidential election in its 23 years of independence. Ukraine is embroiled in its worst political crisis since the fall of the Soviet Union. It is largely divided between a Ukrainian-speaking West, where most people are eager to join the European Union, and a Russian-speaking East rooted in ties to Russia. The divide was magnified a few days after President Viktor Yanukovych fled when Russian President Vladimir Putin annexed Crimea. More than two dozen candidates are running for leadership on Sunday. According to polls, Petro Poroshenko, one of Ukraine's richest men, is the odds-on favorite. Poroshenko is portrayed as a man who has steered clear of any involvement in corruption issues, although not all voters are convinced. And recovering from the record flooding of the past week will cost Bosnia and Serbia billions that neither country has. Although there's no official total for flood damages, preliminary estimates are nearly 1.8 billion for Bosnia alone. In neighboring Serbia, Prime Minister Aleksandar Vucic said damages could reach $2 billion. Both countries already have opened negotiations with the European Union to support reconstruction efforts. Separately, Bosnia's Serb region has opened talks with its ally, Russia. The flooding affected 40% of Bosnia, wrecking the agriculture industry by wiping out farms, buildings, and homes. A million Bosnians have been affected by six days of floods and 2,100 landslides. The flooding has led to at least 51 deaths. Now let's turn our attention to the Middle East, where Lassie has a correspondent, Brian Bush, standing by in Jerusalem. And Brian, let's start by continuing to learn about the visit of Pope Francis to the Holy Land. Yesterday you said he'll visit some holy sites in Jordan. What sites are there in that land? Hi, right, well, good morning. Yeah, the Hashemite Kingdom of Jordan actually has a lot of biblical sites to visit. Uh, the ones that Mr., excuse me, that Pope Francis will be visiting uh, is Mount Nebo, the traditional place where Moses stood and overlooked the promised land. Remember, he brought the children of Israel out of Egypt. They wandered in the desert for 40 years. And then God took him up to a mountain and showed him the promised land because he wouldn't allow him to go enter into the promised land himself. 
and then Moses died and was buried there. Uh, Pope Francis will be visiting there, as well as the traditional site of Jesus' baptism from the Jordanian side. Now, the baptism of Jesus, the Bible's clear, it happened in the Jordan River, in the Jordan Valley, in Judea and Samaria, as the Bible puts it. And so that is, an, is today the physical border between the kingdom of Jordan and the state of Israel. So the Pope is going to visit that holy place from the Jordanian side, which is very significant for them, obviously. So, Brian, what kind of impact, if any, do you think the Pope's visit to the Holy Land will bring? Well, really, I, it kind of depends on whom you ask that question to, because, you know, the Pope, again, has to walk this very fine line of, of not showing sides one way or the other. Even in showing God's side, he has to be very careful in how he pronounces the, those views. And so uh, uh, people want him you know, to uh, reiterate their positions here because these are such charged historical, ethnic, religious issues that are here. And I think that uh, the Pope really wants this to be a goodwill uh, visit. He wants, you know, pilgrimage is all about feeding the soul. He is the leader of the Roman Catholic Church. As a Christian leader, he wants to feed his soul. And then he wants to feed the flock around him and the indigenous flock that is here. So I think that's what he's aiming for, as well as the leader that he is interacting, interfacing with the Muslim leaders, the Jewish leaders, the political leaders of this land. Brian, as far as the news right there in Israel, I heard Mr. Netanyahu, the prime minister, is very upset with one of his key coalition partners in the government. What happened? Yeah, that's right. Reportedly so upset that he was ready to fire C.P. Livni, his justice minister and chief negotiator for peace with the Palestinians. Uh, remember earlier in the week we spoke about, I reported about how C.P. Livni had met with Mahmoud Abbas, the president of the Palestinian Authority in London, and they held a meeting. So, uh, it, it was typified as a private meeting uh, by Israeli officials. But Mr. Netanyahu, who didn't take too likingly to that meeting, and so he was ready, reportedly, uh, to chew her out and send her on her way, and Yair Lapid came to her rescue. And he did so because C.P. Livni, although she doesn't have a large coalition representation, uh, she is a person who is a figure of the left, of the secular Israel, like Yair Lapid. And... Uh, uh, these two individuals, a lot of Israelis look to them to preserving the secular nature of Israel. And so Mr. Lapid said, look, you know, if you take her out, the coalition is going down because Mr. Lapid has a large representation both on the cabinet and in the coalition. And he definitely would have driven Mr. Netanyahu's government to the grave, and there would have been the call for new elections had Mr. Netanyahu carried out his threat. And, and Brian, for the last week or so, we've been talking about Israel's presidency. It's obviously an important office in the country. It's currently occupied by Shimon Peres. What's the latest with that? Because I know there's been quite a bit of controversy lately around that position. Yes, controversy still swirls around the office of the presidency still. Uh, the most recent news is that June 10th is now the date of election where the members of the Knesset will choose the next president of the state of Israel. Uh, one of the candidates has now dropped out, Sylvain Shalom. He was earlier uh, accused of sexual misconduct, uh, although he was found innocent of the accusations against him. He has now seen it fit to drop out. With his dropping out, Mr. Netanyahu has lost the figure that he more than likely would have endorsed uh, to be president because of the relationship between Mr. Shalom and Mr. Netanyahu. Mr. Netanyahu feeling that, uh, that Mr. Shalom as president would have done his bidding, uh, voted the way he wanted him to vote, uh, spoke the way he wanted him to speak. But now the three candidates who are left are much more outspoken against Mr. Netanyahu. Therefore, Mr. Netanyahu appears not to be ready to endorse any of the candidates, 
which means that people are pretty much free to choose who their coalition partners and leaders or conscience would see fit. All right, Brian, thank you very much for the update. Enjoy your weekend. That's Brian Bush reporting from Israel. Still to come, is peace still possible over there? Stefan talks with prophecy teacher Irvin Baxter to get his take on the stalled Middle East peace talks. And up next, author Charles Krismier discusses the next big event on the prophetic clock. Harvest continues in just a moment. The entire Middle East seems to be at a boiling point, and if ever the region needed the light of God's love and truth, the time is now. That's why Lassie is turning to you today to ensure our daily broadcasts of METV continue to share the gospel to hurting people in 19 countries across the Middle East, including Israel. We must receive $300,000 by May 31st to keep METV broadcasting. So please visit us online today to give a generous gift. Go to Lassie.com, Lassie.com. Pastor, attorney, and radio broadcaster Charles Krizmeyer says that we live in exceptional prophetic times. And while previous generations thought that theirs might be the last, something is definitely different about the 21st century. According to Charles, the focal point, which will escalate an end-time clash of cultures, is a 37-acre parcel of land in Jerusalem. Good to have you with us today, sir. And uh, we're talking about being the king of the mountain. Uh, the fact that uh, he who rules the Temple Mount rules the world. That's that 37-acre parcel of land there, smack dab in the middle of Israel. Uh, good to have you with us. Uh, Got to like, get right into this because there's so much involved. Oh, yeah. Why is it different today? Why do you say in the 21st century there are signs, there are evidences of the end times that really bring us to uh, the, the focal point of all these happening in things happening in our generation. Well, Stefan, what we're seeing is the convergence or confluence of history and prophecy coming together and becoming congruent mm. uh, in our time. Uh, in the past, we've been looking for prophecy to develop. Mm -hmm. Now we're seeing the prophecy having developed and merging now with history and they're becoming congruent and that's exactly what we would expect to have happened mm -hmm. with the prophecies of the ancient prophets and also uh, that of Jesus, of the Apostle Paul, John and so on. We're seeing that all come together in one surging maelstrom, I believe, heading toward the mm -hmm. second coming. Mm -hmm. And uh, even in secular circles, you know, whether it's talk about climate change mm -hmm. or, you know, and, and the entertainment industry, you know, the end of the world, you know, movies like I think uh, Tomorrow, Day After Tomorrow, whatever it was called, or these zombie things as well. Uh, it seems like uh, it's not just the religious circles or faith circles that are kind of projecting uh, the fact that, you know, this might be history wrapping up. Well, have you noticed also that the word Armageddon is used continuously? Mm -hmm. It's used to describe uh, severe economic circumstances. It's used to describe uh, severe uh, political circumstances, mm -hmm. the clashes of the nations, and uh, the secular world. We're finding it uh, even in the popular uh, news media, even in our movies. Mm -hmm. Armageddon, Armageddon, Armageddon. And uh, while it's reflecting the times, it's also, uh, shall I say, neuterizing the people and their ability to respond to the reality mm -hmm. of what really is, is developing yeah. in our time. Okay, so Charles, about 25 years ago, we never even heard, we didn't hear too much about Islam, but you make this statement that I think the, this statement uh, consists of fighting words, in my opinion. You say, <laughs> a clash of cultures that will force the West to finally accept the goals of Islam, nothing short of world domination and the institution of Islamic law, Sharia law. I mean, I mean, is that really possible? I know it's possible because we see it seeping into different parts of the United States now. There are cases that are um, going through the court system right mm -hmm. now where Sharia law is um, mm -hmm. the topic of discussion. What say you about that? Well, it's not just the topic of discussion. Mm -hmm. It's invaded the White House. It's invaded our entire government. And because of multiculturalism, religious uh, mm -hmm. uh religious pluralism and political correctness, I call it the unholy trinity. Mm. Once you move into that line of thinking, it completely prevents you from thinking rationally 
and accepting the rational consequences of that which is right there in front of your face in black and white. The Quran clearly mandates that Islam is to rule the world. That was uh, uh, Muhammad's goal. That was the whole idea. And now we're living in a moment of time with the Islamic revolution having taken place in 1979 and uh, Khomeini and so on, uh, what has happened is they believe that this is the resurrection time mm -hmm. now for Islam. This is their propitious moment to gain dominion and fulfill the prophecy, so to speak, and the command of the Quran uh, to rule the world. Mm -hmm. So uh, there's no question about it. And they deem, they've already declared Jerusalem to be their premier goal. Mm -hmm. Why Jerusalem? Yeah. Because Jerusalem is the place where God chose to place his name there. Mm -hmm. And speaking of Jerusalem, uh, being again, King of the Mountain is, is the title of your, your new project here. He who rules Temple Mount rules the world. Mm -hmm. What is it about that 37 acre parcel of land, the Temple Mount, where now the, the Dome of the Rock is, is housed, that is the, uh, the catalyst or the spark point of so much controversy and conflict worldwide? Well, the reason is because that's the place where the Bible says that God chose to place his name there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, David uh, was called in the scripture a man after God's own heart, and he established Mount Zion. He's the one that gained victory over the Jebusites mm -hmm. and established Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city of peace. God chose Jerusalem to place his name there. He chose his holy mount the Temple Mount to place his name there. And throughout the scriptures, once you begin to see this theme of the Mount of God, the Holy Mount, the King of the Mountain, you begin to see it woven through the scriptures, both Old Testament and New Testament. Mm -hmm. uh, it is a prominent theme and God calls that Mount his Holy Mount. Mm -hmm. In fact, in Psalm 2, we have a, a dramatic uh, presentation of this. Why do the nations rage? Mm -hmm. Why do the people imagine a vain Same and foolish thing? thing? Yeah. The kings of the earth have exalted themselves against the Lord and against his anointed saying, let's cast their bonds asunder. Mm -hmm. In other words, they want to rule and reign over the holy mount. But here's God's response. He says, but God will have them in derision. Mm -hmm. He will laugh at them. He will have them in derision. He says, yet have I set my king upon my holy hill. So in the vernacular, to finish that passage, it says, all right, you leaders of the world, you better get your act in order. You better decide to kiss the king, that is Yeshua, Messiah, mm -hmm. the Lord of glory, because push is coming to shove and he is gonna rule and reign. You better get your act together. Mm -hmm. Psalm the, two. Those, those uh, uh, attitudes or tributes of, of deception, unholy desire, domination. Mm -hmm. uh, you also point out that uh, that's, that's really not an earthly thing in and of itself that those very attributes began in heaven. And so what we see here is, is a, uh, a, a pull behind the veil to look into the, the spirit world that's yes. behind all of these uh, really events and, and uh, forces and conflicts coming together uh, to fulfill God's prophetic calendar. Well, I'm so glad you mentioned that because all of this goes back before mankind was created on the earth mm -hmm. with Satan's conflict with God on the mount of God in the heavenlies. Mm -hmm. And he said, I will ascend to the heights of the north. I will be like the most high. And God cast him out. And uh, because of that, God then created man on the earth. He gave dominion to man on the earth. And mm -hmm. Satan says, aha, I couldn't gain dominion in heaven. heaven. Mm -hmm. So now I'm going to gain dominion on the earth through the man that God has created. And for the last 6,000 years of human history, he has now been choreographing that event in order to ultimately place his representative on God's, God's holy, holy mount. That's mm -hmm. the counterfeit Christ, the antichrist. And we are seeing the final movements of the nations now configuring and confederating in order to accomplish that purpose. Well, talk about survival of the fittest as it relates to um, world globalism. You mm -hmm. talk about that in your book as well. Right. What do you mean? Well, uh, survival of the fittest, evolution. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the, the thing about evolution is that it causes man to elevate himself above a creator. Evolution denies a creator. Mm -hmm. And if you went to Revelation chapter 14, it's the final gospel message in the Bible. God is going to raise up an angel. 
you can read it right there in Revelation 14, verses 6 and 7. And that angel is going to say three things to the nations of the earth. The first is, fear God. The second is, glorify Him. And the third is, worship Him that made heaven and earth. If you believe in evolution, you cannot fulfill the third part of that gospel message. Therefore, you will already have denied the Lordship of Jesus Christ, who is the creator of all things, and there, there will be no way for you to effectively and completely accept the fullness of the gospel. This is a very serious thing, and it's about whether man will place himself on the holy hill as opposed to the Lord Jesus Christ. Mm. Well, you know, sometimes it's a little easy to remove yourself from the situation because we're talking about them over in the Middle East. Yes. But this message is for all Christians. This uh -huh. will impact the world. Talk about how Christians should respond or what can we do or is there anything that we can do? Well, there is something that we can do. Mm -hmm. And it, it's reflected in the choices that we make every day. Okay. Whether or not we will fear the Lord, whether or not we will respond to His commands. Right now, the most despised word in the church across the Western world is the word obey. O-B-E-Y. Oh, yeah. It's the one word that God says will please Him. Jesus four times in John 14 said, if you love me, keep my commandments. If you don't love me, you won't keep my commandments. If you love me, I and my Father will make ourselves manifest to you. Obey. Mm -hmm. Obedience is better than sacrifice and to hearken to the fat of rams. If we refuse to obey, we also are refusing to allow the Lord to rule upon the temple mount of our hearts. Mm -hmm. So the number one issue of our time is, will we obey? We had a song that we used to sing, trust and obey. For there's no other way. All right. You can't have trust without obedience. obedience. Neither can you have obedience without trust. Mm -hmm. It is the dynamic duo that glues us together with the Spirit of the Lord for these end times so that the King of glory can rule and reign on the Temple Mount of our hearts. Mm. Uh, one last question, Charles. You mentioned uh, kind of that, that trifecta of political correctness. Yes. And uh, mm -hmm. when it comes to that type of, again, spirit or culture, is it, you, you, have you seen that seep into the church? You talk about the, um, the, the rush towards oneness or unity, the mm -hmm. unity movement right. that's prevalent in the church today and as well and kind of adopting some of those thoughts. Uh, how, how has that kind of brought us to the point of not being able to see maybe where we are in God's prophetic calendar? Political correctness is what you might call institutionalized uh, uh, peer pressure. Mm -hmm. It is peer pressure that applies to a whole culture and is designed to compel, to force every man, woman, and child to speak the same thing, to not speak other things, mm -hmm. meaning mm -hmm. that if it doesn't coordinate with the general feelings of the day, and by the way, the feelings have become Lord, yeah. faith has mm -hmm. taken short shrift, feelings have become Lord, and in the light of the worship of feelings now, from the church house to the White House, the school house, yeah. uh, mm -hmm. every other house, we now have a situation where political correctness has dominion not only in the White House, not only in the school house, but in the church house. Pastors are capitulating to political correctness, to multiculturalism, to religious pluralism over and over oh, again. Yeah. And uh, I tell you, it makes me wince. I've grown up in the church. My father was a pastor for 50 years. I have pastored myself, been broadcasting for 19 years, and I watch these things happen. I mm -hmm. talk with thousands and thousands of pastors and parachurch leaders, and we are engaged in an ultimate warfare right now. The enemy of our souls is not just out there in Islam. Mm -hmm. The enemy of our souls is right in our own house, mm. and we don't recognize him. Wow. Wow. So good to have you with us today. Uh, Charles Chris Meyer, the eternal epic end time battle, king of the mountain, he who rules Temple Mount rules the world. To connect with Charles, you can go to saveus.org. You can remember that one. Or if you can't, you can go to our website, harvest-tv.com. Click on show info in the menu bar and you'll find a link to get back to King of the Mountain. Pick up a copy for yourself and also connect with Charles on his website there. Coming up a little bit later on in the show, actually very soon, is peace really possible? in the Middle East. Is it still possible? I'm going to be talking with prophecy teacher Irv Baxter to get his take on the stalled Middle East peace process. That'll come up next here on The Harvest Show. 
Jesus said, where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Do you have some treasures like silver and gold coins or little jewelry that you don't wear anymore? Why not invest them into changing lives for Jesus? Ask yourself if these treasures are really worth keeping, or should you invest them into making an eternal difference in someone's life? Call 1-800-365-3732 for a prepaid insured shipping envelope. Lay up your treasure in heaven. It'll be waiting for you when you get there. The Lord is my strength and my defense. He has become my salvation. He is my God, and I will praise him. My Father's God, and I will exalt him. My God is my rock in whom I take refuge, my shield and the horn of my salvation. He is my stronghold, my refuge, and my savior. From violent people you save me. I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Want to accept Jesus as your personal saviour or have questions about Christian life? Call Prayer Line at 1-800-365-3732. Behind me, the old city of Jerusalem, Temple Mount, the Kidron Valley. I'm standing on the Mount of Olives. But what's really important is that every home in Israel can get Middle East television. We're reaching into those untold thousands and hundreds of thousands of people's homes that we can reach with the gospel because of Middle East television. You know, I was thrilled just this morning being able to watch the Lester Summerall teaching program talking about the prophets of the Bible with Arabic subtitling. Can you imagine that? Reaching out around the world with the gospel is what we're all about. Making a difference in people's lives, changing people's lives. We can't do it without your help. We need partners in faith. We need our partners to step forward and help us as we reach out and touch people literally all over the Middle East. This month of May, we are looking for 300 partners to give $1,000 for the gospel to be preached in the Arab world on METV. Will you be one of them? We can change lives today by you going to the phone and being a partner in faith. All right, we've got a special guest here on Harvest today, Brother Irvin, Irvin Baxter. He is the president and founder of End Time Ministries. And Brother Baxter, good to have you with us. Thank you for taking time to uh, contribute to our show today. I know that you're in Israel and that you have been following the peace talks that have been recently suspended. I must ask you, why should uh, believers, why should Christians be concerned with talks like these? And how do they play out potentially for uh, Israel's prophetic future? Well, the peace talks are going to succeed eventually, whether it's now or later, because the Bible specifically prophesies there is going to be a peace agreement, and this will be the most important prophetic fulfillment in the last 2,000 years. The Bible teaches when this agreement is concluded, it starts the final seven years to the Battle of Armageddon and the second coming of Jesus back to this earth. Mm. So uh, what do you think that we should be watching for now uh, in these peace talks and, uh, you know, as they resume? And what kind of role do you think that the United States is going to play uh, in the furtherance or the resumption of the peace talks? Well, most people believe that the United States is an indispensable broker, that we're the only one with enough influence with Israel and the Palestinians to bring them together for a peace agreement. So these talks are definitely going to be restarted whenever we don't know for certain. Some people think pretty quickly now, but we don't know. But they will be restarted. There will be a peace agreement. The United States will play a role in all this. And that means that we will then enter the final seven years to the Battle of Armageddon. We've been speaking a lot about prophetic events on today's program, and recently you've established a prophecy college right in Jerusalem itself. Tell us a little bit about that college, about that ministry, and how that you hope people in Israel will respond to uh, basically uh, the study of New Testament prophecies. Well, we're entering the time of the most rapid prophetic fulfillment in the history of the world right now. And most of those fulfillments are going to happen right here in Jerusalem and in the nation of Israel. But most Jewish people understand very little about Bible prophecy. So I want to help them to understand 
First Chronicles chapter number 12, verse 32 says that the sons of Issachar were men who had understanding of the times to know what Israel ought to do. We have dedicated our prophecy college here to imparting understanding of the times to the Jewish people so that they can know what they should be doing. Mm. Well, Brother Baxter, as uh, prophetic events continue to unfold, as history and prophecy run congruent together, as we've discovered today as well, uh, what do you think will happen to the people that are living there in Israel, and how should we, as uh, followers of Christ, be praying for them? Actually, I do. You see, Russia has surrounded Israel, and the Bible prophesies that Russia will be the leading force of a UN army to come down against Israel at the time of the Battle of Armageddon. Russia now is allied with Syria, with Bashar al-Assad. Russia also is very closely allied with Iran on the east of Israel. Now with Egypt, once the United States pulled out and turned against the present regime in Egypt, R Russia moved in and said, we'll sell you what you need, we'll be your friend. So that left Russia on the north, the east, and the south. But there's one thing left, the Mediterranean side. Well, Crimea is the port that Russia needs to access the Mediterranean. So Russia now has an open access to the Mediterranean so that she can totally surround the nation of Israel. The stage actually has now been set for the future battle of Armageddon. Mm. Well, thank you so much for joining us. Irvin Baxter joining us here on Harvest today. He is the founder and president of End Time Ministries. And uh, for more information to connect with Irvin, you go to endtime.com. When we return today here on Harvest, Dr. Harold Hazen is going to discuss how soon-to-be retirees can maximize their Social Security benefits. There has never been a greater need for the life-changing Bible teaching than right now. And the Daily Dr. Lester Summerall teaching programs, which have been on the air for over 50 years, are still reaching around the world. They run some of Dr. Summerall's old ministries, and they are just, they're powerful. <laughs> they are just powerful. When you join with us as an endowment partner in faith, you're investing in lives. So call today, 1-800-365-3732 or partnerinfaith.com. Did you know that millions live in spiritual darkness seeking the Word of God? Lacey Broadcasting is piercing the darkness 24 hours a day. The window of opportunity to reach people with the gospel of Jesus Christ has never been greater, but who knows when it will close. Join Partners in Faith today for as little as $25 a month, and you can help us bring light into a dark world. Join us by visiting PartnerInFaith.com today. If you're approaching retirement and wondering about Social Security, this segment is for you. There are ways to increase your benefits by hundreds and thousands of dollars. And joining me with that information is Harold Hazen. He's the Chief Development Officer for Lacey Broadcasting and my colleague. And I'm always glad to do this segment because I get a chance to pick your brain. Harold, Good Social be Security benefits. I mean, you know, actually, I've been thinking about Social Security benefits since the first day I started working. In, uh -huh. my, in my 20s when I graduated from college and right. started working. Right, well, Social Security has been in the news a lot because mm -hmm. a lot of changes have occurred. And in, in the almost 80 years since we started talking about Social Security and retirement, we set the retirement age at 65. Now, in our last segment, we talked about life expectancies going up tremendously. So that 65 may not really be the ideal age anymore. And it really makes a difference as to when we will pick the time when we'll start receiving those benefits. It, uh, it makes a tremendous difference if we can start taking them at 62 sometimes, or you want to wait till you're 65 or 66, or even till you're 70, it can make a big difference. And so it's, and, and nobody can really tell you what the right age is for mm -hmm. you because it depends on a lot of factors, but it's good to know. And it's good, like I advise people, if it's possible to hang on as long as you can and don't take your benefits. Okay. So if 70 is the new 60 and 60 is the new 50 and even 40, yeah. then how do we calculate, you know, when's the best time or you know, when to even start thinking about retirement. Well, I put together a couple of charts like mm -hmm. I like to do for our folks so that they can actually see what, uh, what the differences are. And if we can put those up on the screen for them, we'll, uh, we'll show the, 
the, the, if we retired at the age of 62, this is an example of a person who, who let's say, uh, full retirement age of, 80, of 66, mm -hmm. They would be eligible for $2,230 per month. Now, that's just an example because everybody's going to be a little bit different, but that's a good medium, yes. median example. Uh, if that person were to retire at age 62, that would diminish to $1,682 per month, so a significant drop in their monthly uh, benefits that they're receiving. However, if they wait till they're age 70, all the way up to $2,944 a month, so a tremendous increase in just that eight years between 62 and 70. Mm -hmm. And in my next chart, I show the dramatic difference of what can happen during your lifetime. Just take a look at that. Wow. Now, if that person were to live to age 95, and that's not a stretch anymore. Mm -hmm. People are healthier, life expectancy is a lot longer than it used to be. And so living to age 95 is a very real possibility for a lot of people. If you started taking your benefits at age 62, you would realize $666,000. If you waited to start taking your benefits at age 66, you'd get $776,000, $110,000 more during your lifetime. But look mm -hmm. what happens if you wait till age I 70 see that. Look to at start that. taking your benefits. Mm -hmm. $883,000, over $220,000 more during your lifetime. So it makes a significant difference as to when you choose to start taking those Social Security benefits. Okay, so Hera, what, when should we actually start even giving thought to this. You know, my daughter is a millennial. I can, yeah. I can assure you that she's not thinking about retirement right now. Mm -hmm. I have to tell her, make sure you get into, like, you know, some 401k, invest, yeah. and things of that nature. When's the, the best time to start thinking and acting in that manner? Well, the sooner the better. And your okay. daughter being young, being, being a millennial, it's a good time to start thinking about retirement because when you start putting money away early, it compounds, yes. you know, the miracle of compound interest. So the sooner you start putting money away. But in terms of determining <clears throat> when it is time to retire and when it is time to start taking your, uh, your benefits, a lot of it depends on your health. If you expect to have good health and you're living strong and you're going to probably outlive your life expectancy, if you don't need the income, then you're better off to wait. Okay, so, I mean, and, you know, this all kind of ties in to the Ministry of Lissy Broadcasting. That's when right. We're thinking, that we're thinking about somebody's spiritual well-being. We're yep. also thinking about their financial well-being. Yeah. Now, what are some of the other ways that here at Lissy Broadcasting that we offer to people? Where well, this is why I talk about the charitable gift annuity for mm -hmm. so many times. Every time I'm on, I try to bring it up because it's such a great tool for us to use when we retire because it provides fixed income. This is something that Linda and I have done in our lives. We get a fixed check comes in about every April. We get it once a year. We can guarantee that it's going to be there. It's going to be there for the rest of our lives. Uh, two thirds of it is tax free. Uh, our effective interest rate is about 8%. Uh, we can have that for the rest of our lives. We know it's there. And that's why the charitable gift annuity is such a good, attractive investment because you're investing in God's work. You're investing in the lives of men, women, and children all over the world. And you're investing in yourself. It's good to have a portfolio when you retire of the fixed income, like a social security, like a charitable mm -hmm. gift annuity, and also some variable income things, flexible income things like your 401k. Okay, so like, you, you know, when we look at the words social security, you know, there's some talk that it may not be as secure, but this charitable gift annuity, you're saying that it is fixed and you can depend on it every that's right. month. Yeah, it's something that's been around for hundreds of years. I think in 1843, the first one was written by the American Bible Society. Mm -hmm. I have done this for years and years and years with hundreds of people. Um, I've never known anyone not to get their payments on time. It's always there. It's fixed. It's guaranteed. We use a foundation that, uh, that administers this for us. So even if Lassie ministry should go away, the foundation will be there to pay these payments every year. So it's about as guaranteed an income as you can get and it's fixed. So how can people, you know, what are some of the requirements to be, you know, to start this charitable gift? Well, it works good for people who are 50 years old and older, and the okay. older a person is, the higher the rate of interest. But we just invite people to call us and get the information for themselves, and we're not going to send them a big packet of information that they have to sort through and decide if this works for me or doesn't work for me. We're going to give them a personalized, customized in illustration that perfectly fits their situation so that they can make a decision as to whether it works for them. So I always invite people to 
take care, take the opportunity and find out. The more options you have, the better off you are. So, uh, Harold, before I let you go, just kind of recap what we talked about in terms of those Social Security benefits and when you should consider taking them and and just kind of recap that for us. Well, you can take them as early as age 62 or you can wait till you're age 70 to take your benefits. The earlier you take your benefits, the less money you're going to get. The later you can wait, the more money you're going to get. I always advise people that if you have income and you don't need it right away, yes. if your health is good, why take your income early? Why not wait and realize as much as two hundred dollars or $300,000 more in your lifetime depending on how long you live? You may need that income uh, someday. Okay, so Harold, as I said, I love having you on because this is like free financial or investment advice about the charitable gift annuities, mm -hmm. and you share information um, with many of our baby boomers who are yes. watching that's mm -hmm. extremely valuable. For more information about gift planning, you can go to giftplanningatlasee.com or call 1-866-224-2087 or just go to legacy.lasee.com. Stay with us. Would you like to have a secure source of income for the rest of your life? What if that income was set and would never change no matter what the economy does? And at the same time, what if you knew you were changing lives for Jesus? That's right, it's a charitable gift annuity, the amazing part investment, part gift that never stops giving. The rates are much higher than savings accounts or certificates of deposit. It's the perfect way to honor God with your finances and fulfill the Great Commission. If you are over 49 and a half years old and you have at least $10,000, you may qualify. Call us at 1-866-224-2087 or go online to giftplanningatlasc.com. This hard to believe opportunity may not always be available, so call now while the rates of return are still high. Do it today, won't you? We're not going to catch up with Pastor Charles today, but doesn't mean that our prayer lines closed or out of service. Folks are back there. We've got wonderful volunteers that are in right now and in 24-7. Love to hear from you today. If there's some things going on in your life, you'd like to just uh, connect with someone, talk about uh, what, what's going on, go to the Word of God, pray together. Prayer line's a place to call, 1-800-365-3732. You can also email prayer at and uh, when those emails come in, volunteers will get them. They'll take time to read through them, pray, and then respond back to you as well. If you'd like to go online, worldharvest.com is the interactive website for Prayer Line where you can log in prayer requests as well as see the prayer requests of others and pray for someone as well, which is a great uh, way to connect us as the body of Christ. And if you'd like to write, as you saw there on our screen, our street address, 61300 Ironwood Road in South Bend, Indiana, zip code 46614. The reason we say all that is because folks might be listening on shortwave radio yes. and they don't have a screen to look at, so they need to, uh, need to hear where they can connect. Well, you know, Dr. Sumrall, who, who founded our ministry here, he wrote a number of books. One of them was called The Secrets of Answered Prayer, and that's where today's selection from the treasury of Dr. Lester Sumrall comes from. And it, it's interesting that we talked about prayer line because Dr. Sumrall writes, For Whom Should We Pray? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. An old Southern preacher once said, not, you know, any story that begins with an old Southern preacher <laughs> once said can't be too bad. It's going to be a good story. An old Southern preacher once said there are two basic kinds of prayer shotgun prayers and rifle prayers. Mm -hmm. When you pray shotgun prayers, you just pray in some general direction hoping you'll hit a target. With the rifle prayers, you take careful aim and shoot, knowing that you have a specific target in mind and knowing that your prayers will accomplish their desired end. If we want to pray and receive answers to our prayers, we must give proper attention to this very important manner of targeting our prayers so as to prevent the possibility of pr praying amiss. Our families are our prime responsibility. We cannot, we dare not overlook them. We should pray for the salvation of all people everywhere. If God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, as we're told in John 3, 16, for that world, then we ought to pray for that world. We should pray for our own city and for our nations, pray for the leaders of our nation, 
and we can change our nation with our prayers. Never forget that. We should also pray for the pastors and workers in Christ's service. Often these great men and women work too hard for too many long hours and they literally burn themselves out over the gospel. And why do they do it? Because there is no one to stand in the gap to help them. So as you pray, pray with a target and make sure you hit it. Mm -hmm. Great <laughs> words. That is, and you know, I kind of laughed to myself because I'm guilty of those shotgun prayers. Oh, yeah. sure. Usually when I'm very tired. Yeah. And, you know, I'm... Unfocused. Yeah, not focused. But you're, it's so true that when you have, when you target those prayers and then you see them come to fruition, you see God answer those prayers, it's amazing. I mean, God will answer shotgun prayers as well. But when we target our prayers and, and we see God work in our lives, it's just amazing to watch that unfold. Mm -hmm. well, I think it's in the book of James where it's written that um, you don't get what you pray for because you're praying for things that will be consumed by your lust mm -hmm. right. rather than praying for the will of God. And, and certainly that's why we're taught in the Our Father, you know, thy will be done. That's the most important thing that we can pray for is that God's will be done. And it doesn't mean that things are always going to go the way that we want them to go. But that's because God's in control, not us. And if you look at a big picture focus of that, you should probably be pretty glad about that, that God's in control <laughs> and not us, because how many times do we make the wrong decision? But God never makes the wrong decision because God made you and he made you very special and he wants you to be happy in serving him. So today, make sure you spend some time talking with God and find out what his will is for your life. And I know part of that will is to come back and see us tomorrow on Harvest. God loves the Middle East, especially Jerusalem. The Bible says in the 87th Psalm that God loves the gates of Zion more than all the dwellings of Jacob. That's why your support for METV is so important. Are you one of the 300 God is speaking to about a $1,000 seed gift this month? Gideon's 300 soldiers witnessed amazing blessings when they trusted God to go against vastly superior odds. What blessings can you expect when you trust God and demonstrate faith? God says He will show you great and mighty things which your mind cannot even imagine. Ask God to give you the faith to stretch yourself to be one of the 300 this month to sow a seed of faith. Call us now, 1-800-365-3732 and tell the operator you are one of the 300 God has called to sow a $1,000 seed. God loves the Middle East. Show Him that you do too. Lay up your treasure in heaven. Someday that's all the treasure you'll have. A successful life requires a healthy mind and a strong body, which is why Making Healthy Choices has developed our own vitamin B12 with folic acid, promoting focus, nervous system health, and cardiovascular support. You won't find this product in stores only by going to mhclife.com. It's time for life. It's time for a new you. Go to mhclife.com or call the number on the screen. It's time for life. The Harvest Show is produced by LaCie Broadcasting and is viewer supported by people just like you. Thank you for inviting us into your home today.